Good evening, good evening, good evening. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to our midweek gospel explosion, pastoral teachings. Certainly, we thank God for you sharing your time with us on today. Well, we do honor God, who is sovereign and supreme, to his son, Jesus Christ, who is Savior and Lord, and to the Holy Ghost, who is our comforter, leader, teacher, and our guide. He who leads us in the way of all truth and righteousness. And to each of you in your respective places, we greet you with Jesus' joy and certainly in divine love. Well, tonight, we'd like to call your attention to 1 Thessalonians. That's New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we'll begin reading at verse 10. 1 Thessalonians, that's just past Colossians, and just before 2 Thessalonians, you'll find 1 Thessalonians. If you're there, or when you're there, you will find these words recorded. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we have or we behave ourselves among you that believed. As you know, how we exhorted and comfort and charge every one of you as a father does his children, that we would walk worthy of God, who have called you unto his kingdom and glory. Verse 13, key verse. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you now for this preaching and teaching moment we pray now, God, that you will release your power, your presence, your anointing upon this vessel that I may preach and teach with power and with clarity. Anoint each of us the more that we might receive, believe, explore, apply, and share this word. In advance, we give you all of the honor, all of the glory, and all of the praise. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Every heart said, Amen. From that particular text, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 13, we want to speak from these words. <clears throat> Victorious in the midst of our suffering. Victorious or victory in the midst of our suffering. As we look at Paul's letter to the, the church at Thessalonica, <coughs> Paul has many pleasant memories of the days he spent with the infant church at Thessalonica. Their faith, hope, love, and perseverance in the face of persecution, are exemplary. Paul now, as he penned this letter to the Thessalonians Christians, Paul is deeply thankful for their reception and acceptance of the message that he gives them. Paul considered himself as a spiritual father to the believers at Thessalonica. Paul pointed out three of his duties as their spiritual father. His work in verse 9, his walk in verse 10, and his words in verse 11 and 12. Listen what he says in verse 9, as he pointed out his duties as their spiritual father, he pointed out his work 
He says, for ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God, his work. Then he points them to his walk. Verse 10, he says, you are witnesses and God also how holy and justly and unblameable we behave ourselves among you that believe. He talked about his walk. Then he talked about his words in verse 11 and 12. And he says, as you know how the how we exhort and comfort and charge every one of you as a father does his children, that you walk, that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. So Paul was thankful for the church at Thessalonica. And so he writes to them, uh, telling them how he felt about them. Then comes verse 13. Now, before we get to that particular verse, as we dive in very carefully and closely, I want us to understand that it was not easy to be a Christian in Thessalonica. It was not easy because there in Thessalonica, believers faced persecution and suffering. Yet in the midst of suffering, the Thessalonian Christians experience joy. That's why I tag this message, victorious in the midst of our suffering. In the midst of the Thessalonian church, believers face persecution and they face suffering. Yet in the midst of suffering, they experience joy. So that let us know in the midst of our suffering and in the midst of our persecution that we still can experience joy. Are you with me? Chapter one, verse six says, they receive Paul's ministry of the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Chapter one, verse six. Now, Paul the apostle, y'all know him, was burdened for his brethren who were going, who was going through suffering and yet he also had joy. It was a fulfillment of our Lord. The reason why we can have victory in the midst of our suffering or can have joy in the midst of our suffering is because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was a fulfillment for Paul and it was a fulfillment for, for the church at Thessalonica because of our Lord, our Lord's promise. He said in St. John, Jesus said in St. John chapter 16, verse 33, in the world, ye shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And because Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, has overcome the world and we are believers in him, and we are followers and disciples of him, then we too can overcome the world. So that means that in the midst of our suffering and even persecution, we can overcome the world. We can have victory. My brothers and my sisters, Churches experience growing pains as they seek to win the loss and glorify the Lord. When we do what God has called, chosen, and commanded for us to do, we will experience growing pains. Every day will be, every day will not be uh, 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 a day of sunshine. There will be some clouds along the way. Listen carefully. 
You see, if we are living a godly life, or we are living godly in Christ, Jesus, or Christ, if we are living a godly life in Christ Jesus, we will suffer for his sake. Are you hearing me? In the times of suffering and persecution, Paul explains that we have God within us. That's what we need to make sure that we remember that in the times of our suffering and persecution, our problems and our pain, our confusion, our calamities, that we have God within us. Not just with us, we are New Testament saints, we have God within us in the personality of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at verse 13 again. Listen to what it says. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Did you get that? All right, now, you see, my brothers and my sisters, the church, the band of baptized believers in Christ, the body of Christ, the church, the call out ones, the ecclesia, the church has been founded on the word of God. Uh-huh. Let's go back to chapter one, verse six. And let, let, me, let me show you something. And listen to what Paul says. He says, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word of God in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You see that? Mm -hmm. You see, we, the church has been founded on the word of God, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the word of God. Paul was thankful that the saints in Thessalonica had the right spiritual attitudes toward the word of God. It's so important, my brothers and sisters, that we have the right attitude toward the word of God. Have the right attitude toward what God says and what he is saying. Are you hearing me? You see, because of that, at Thessalonica, because they had the right attitude toward the word of God, this helped them endure in the hour toward the word of God. It will help us when problems and pain comes, when things, torment and trials and tribulations come. So now, the first thing I discovered about the believers in Thessalonica was that's important to us today. The first thing I notice is that they appreciated the word. They were grateful for the word. How do I know that? They were grateful for the word. They appreciate the word because, number one, they believed the word. They received it. That's so important. And they did not receive it as the word of men. They received it as the word of God. Now that doesn't sound like much, but listen. You see, the Bible is the word of God. And the Bible is different from any other book. The Bible is the word of God and there's no other book like the Bible. The Bible is different from any other book in origin, in character, in content, and in cost. 
Let's see if I can take that a little further. Well, first of all, the Bible, which is the word of God, it was inspired by God. And it was written by men of God who was used by the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. So then God's word, the Bible is holy, pure and perfect. Mm -hmm. The Bible, the word of God, was written at a great cost. Remember I said a few minutes ago, the Bible is different from any other book in its origin, character, content, and cost. It was written at a great cost, not only to the writers, but to Jesus Christ, who came to this world and became man that the word of God might be given to us. It cost Jesus something. It cost the writers something because many of them who wrote uh, the word of God in the New Testament was killed because they stood on the word of God. If we are going to be victorious in the midst of our suffering, listen carefully, we must appreciate the word. We must be grateful. We must be thankful for the word of God. Because the word of God, the Bible is our roadmap. The Bible, the word of God is what was going to lead us from earth to heaven. So we must learn to appreciate the word of God by, first of all, believing what it says, receiving it, exploring it, applying it. And sharing it. So, Paul is saying to us tonight that even in the midst of our suffering and persecution, we have God's word within us. And the church at Thessalonica had God's word in them because, number one, they appreciated the word of God. They valued the word of God. Secondly, they appropriated the word of God. They reserved it for a purpose. They possessed it. Now, listen carefully. When Paul pins verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul uses two different words for received in that verse. The first received means to accept from another, while the second received in verse 13 means to welcome. One means the hearing of the ear uh -huh, to accept, while the other means the hearing of the heart to welcome the word of God. Are you hearing me? The believers, the church at Thessalonica not only heard the word, they took it into their inner man or inner person and made it a part of their lives. That's so important for us today, saints, is to make sure that we appreciate the word by believing it and receiving it, hearing it, but we also need to make sure that we appropriate it by welcoming it into 
our hearts, not just hear, hear it, but welcome it into our hearts and to the inner man and make it a part of our daily lives. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, repeatedly warned people about the wrong kind of hearing. Uh-huh. And we got to be careful. And I want to warn you as Jesus warned uh, tonight to be careful of the wrong kind of hearing. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 9, he says, Who have ears to hear, let him hear. Now, we know that he's talking about mankind, so let him or her hear. Meaning, take heed that you hear. Use every opportunity that you have to hear the word of God. Take heed that you hear. You see what's wrong with the church, what's wrong with Christendom today is that many who are part of the church, are part of Christendom, do not desire to hear the word of God. Jesus warned us. He is our Savior, Lord. He warned us to take heed that you hear. Every opportunity that you get, you should want to hear the word of God. And it's the opposite in our daily society. In the 21st century, it is the opposite. You have people who declare and decree that they're saved and sanctified. They profess and they proclaim that they're going to heaven anyhow, but don't have no desire to hear the word of God, even when they have golden opportunities. Not only that warning, but Jesus gave another warning in Matthew's in Mark, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 24. So in, 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 uh, in the last verse, in the last scripture I gave you, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 9, he told them to take heed that you hear. In Mark chapter 4, verse 24, he said, take heed what you hear. Mm -hmm. Wonder why Jesus said that. Well, think about it. How often believers hear the word of God in church school, in morning worship, where, whenever the word of God is being taught or being preached, how often believers hear the word, the, the word of God, and then yet get in their car Turn on the radio and listen to things on the radio or get on their phone and listen or watch programs that help erase the impressions made by the word. So Jesus warns us, take heed what you hear because the word of God could have gone forth in your rec receiving the word and then as soon as you get by yourself, as soon as you get away from the, where the word of God was taught or preached, and then you turn on your radio or turn on your phone or, or what, what, whatever instrument that you use and listen to stuff that actually blot out or erase what you have just heard from the word of God. So he says, take heed what you hear. First, he said, take heed that you hear. Then he says, take heed what you hear. Thirdly, now the third warning is in Luke chapter 8, verse 18. He says, take heed therefore how you hear. Mm -hmm. My brothers and my sisters, many, many people are careless hearers and cannot apply themselves to listen to the teaching of God's word. 
careless hearers. They may be in church, but they don't, don't hear anything the word of God says. And they may hear it, but do not apply it to their lives. These people have itching ears and desire religious entertainment. Man isn't that present in Christendom or church today. So many people just want to hear something that itch their ears. Uh, they just want to be entertained. My brothers and sisters, it's time out for entertainment. We got to know what the word of God says and begin to hear it and apply ourselves not only to the word of to the word of God, but apply ourselves to listen to teachings of God's word. Some of these type people who do not apply themselves to listen or apply themselves to the word of God, some of these type of people are too lazy to apply themselves and pay attention. Now, I'll talk about laziness on Sunday. I talked about the remedy for laziness. And we know that laziness is an issue in today's society. But we do not need to be lazy. We need to be busy. We talked about the ant and how busy the ant is. The, the ant performs, and that, and not only that, but but the the ant make preparation. The ant participates with each other. They they cooperate, and they make preparation uh, for winter time. Or uh, they make preparation for their future. And you watch the ant, and especially during the summertime, you don't hardly see them in the wintertime because they're down in their ant hill. But in the summertime, they're busy carrying food back to their home so they will have food for the summertime. But many of us in Christendom, we are too lazy to apply ourselves to hearing the word of God. We're too lazy to pay attention. Too many churches have substituted entertainment for the preaching and the teachings of God's word. We want to find out how many people that we can make happy. Or how many people we can cause to shout or to dance. The shout, nothing wrong with it. Dancing, the holy dance, nothing wrong with it. But the shout and the dance is not going to keep you when persecution comes. It's not going to keep you when suffering comes. You need God. It's so important that you have the word of God. Listen. Many people no longer even welcome the word of God. There are mega churches that do not preach and teach the entire word of God. But what is going to save us is the word of God. So it is important my brothers and my sisters, it is important that we appropriate the word of God, that we possess the word of God, that we reserve the word of God in our hearts. I hear what you're saying. Perhaps you're asking a question. How do we appropriate the word? Good question. I'm glad you asked. 
simply by understanding it and receiving it into our hearts and by meditating on it so that it becomes part of the inner man. And if you have problems understanding it, the Bible teaches us that we can pray and ask God for understanding. So by understanding it and receiving it into our hearts and by meditating on the word so that it becomes part of our inner person, the spiritual man. Meditation is to the spiritual life what digestion is to the physical life. So important. So the Christians, the believers at Thessalonica, Paul wrote to them and said unto them that when suffering and persecution times come, remember that you have God within you, that we have God within us. And the Christians, the believers at Thessalonica, they was, they, they was able to endure the suffering. And in the midst of their suffering, they could have joy because they appreciated the word. They were grateful for it. There's some Christians not grateful for the word because they don't try to get, they don't try to get it. It's, 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 it's like it's foreign to them. But they, they were the sign of Christian. Are you saved? Yes. Been saved for 40 years. When the last time you studied the word? Well, uh, my brothers and my sisters, it's so important that we understand that suffering time is going to come. Suffering is inevitable. It's going to happen. But the, the church, the believers at Thessalonica, they was able in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their persecution, they were a young church. In the midst of that, they was able to have joy because they appreciated the word and they appropriated the word. They realized that because of who whose they, they were, that they had God in them. And God in them, they appreciate the word. They appropriate the word. And thirdly, last but not least, they applied the word. They put the word to good use. See, you can have joy in the midst of seemingly sorrow. You can have joy in the midst of suffering and persecution because you Know that he who lives in you is greater than he that is in the world. He that lives in you is greater than any problem, any pain, any suffering, that any sadness, any sickness that you can encounter. So they applied the word. They obeyed the word by faith and the word went to work in their lives. Now, let me go back and read verse 13, because all of that is there in, thir in verse 13. Listen to what it says. It says, for this cause, I also, and for this cause, also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, you appreciated it, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as the word, but as it is truth, the word of God appropriated it, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They obeyed the word by faith, by believing it and receiving it. And the word went to work in their lives. Mm -hmm. That's what it says in the last clause, really, of verse 13. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You see that? Listen, my brothers and my sisters, it is not enough to just appreciate the word, to be grateful for it. It's not enough to just appropriate the word by reserving it. We must also apply the word in our lives 
and be hearers and doers of the word. Are you with me? Now turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And let's look at verse 19. I might read a few more other verses. James chapter 1, verse 19. If you're there, listen to what it says. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engraft word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. But be, you, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hero, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Wow. Now look, read that during your leisure time. But I want to show that how it is important to get beyond just being hearers. You got to be doers. Doers of the word. The word of God has in it the power to accomplish the will of God. The word of God really is his will. Mm -hmm. So if you have the word of God in you, then you can accomplish the will of God. But nothing is impossible with God. We've heard that. But that's a true statement. You can stand on that. Nothing is impossible with God. God's commandments are, are God's enablements. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ commanded the crippled man to stretch forth his hand. The very thing that the man could not do. If you remember that. Yet, the word of command gave him the power to obey. He trusted the word. He obeyed and was made whole. Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, talking about the man with the withered hand. So, 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 so the command gave him the power to obey. When once he obeyed the word, as he trusted the word, he was made whole. Mm -hmm. When we believe God's word, I'm trying to drive this home as much as I possibly can. When we believe God's word and obey his word or words, he releases power. Uh-huh. Divine energy that works in our lives to fulfill his purposes. Are you hearing me? So then, as Paul said initially, that although you may go through some suffering, some persecution, just remember that God is within us. Uh-huh. So, the word of God, because God is the word, the word is God. That's what John says in chapter 1 of St. John. The word of God within us is a great source of power. In times of testing and sufferings and persecution and pain and problems and perplexities. If we appreciate the word, believe it in our hearts, appropriate the word, reserve it. It's a part of our thinking and our living. 
and apply the word, then the whole person will be controlled by God's word. And he, God, will give us the victory. That is the victory over the flesh, over our finances, over our friends, over our foes, over the devil and all of his imps. Because God is God within us is more than the world who may be against us. So my brothers and my sisters, remember, we can, actually we are victorious, even in the midst of our suffering. And we can have joy because we know great is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if God is within us through the personality of the Holy Ghost, because we have appreciated the word, we have appropriated the word, we have, we have applied the word, the word of God will work for us, will work in us, will work through us. So that God will get the glory out of our lives. The church at Thessalonica was a young church. But Paul was thankful for their reception and acceptance, their reception and acceptance of the message of Jesus Christ. Yes, Paul considered them as his spiritual children. My brothers and sisters, remember that as a child of God, you will have some pains, some problems. The pains and problems help us to grow. The church is going to have some growing pains. And many times and oftentimes if we don't have any, any pains, we don't have some things that has the tendency to hurt us a little bit, then perhaps we will never grow. Yes, pains causes us to grow. It was pain that caused us to get here. So, we are victorious even in the midst of those things that causes us pain, persecution, and problems. Because God is within us. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for allowing us to come together on tonight. We thank you for this word on tonight, reminding us that we are victorious even in the midst of our suffering. Because of the resonance, because of you residing within the spirit of the believer. Let this word tonight sink deep into our hearts, minds, and our spirits that we'll become better, better Christians, better disciples, better ambassadors of yours as we carry out the assignment that you have given us individually and collectively. We pray now, God, for the church, for the baptized believers in Christ, the called out ones, the body of Christ. We pray that you strengthen us as we go forth and tell the story a Savior that loves us, a God who loves us so that he sent his only begotten son to make sure that we have the right to eternal life. We 
pray for those who may be in trouble within the body, those who may be sick, dealing with a malady or sickness or disease. We pray, Father, that they will remember your word that by Jesus' stripes we were healed. And that they begin to stand on your word because your word is still truth. Your word is still powerful. Your word still makes ways out of no ways. So we pray now, God, that the church, your church, will be about your business as we go forth. We thank you for what you have done for us in the past. We thank you for what you're doing right now. And we even thank you so much for what you're going to do in the future. We thank you that we're saved and sanctified and filled with your precious Holy Ghost. Continue to fill us up, God, so we might be able to do what you have called us to do. We pray for those who may have backslidden, walked away from your presence. We pray for those who may have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. We pray Everyone who bowed under the sign of my voice. And those of you who may have backslidden, come back. God the Father is waiting on you to return unto him. The Bible teaches us that he's married to the backslider. He's waiting on you to come back. He'll receive you if you make that decision. And if you're not saved, never receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Never acknowledge, never admit it. That you were a sinner and you needed a savior. If that's you tonight, we're going to take a moment tonight to pray for you and with you. If that's you tonight, if you pray this prayer with me, I'll repeat after me. Lord God, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I need the gift of salvation. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. He died for my sins and you raised him for my redemption. So I say unto you, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and make me a new creation, a new creature. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. If you prayed that prayer on tonight, according to the Bible, according to the word of God, you are saved. That's your first step. And gaining eternal life or eternal salvation. But what I want you to do, if you pray that prayer on tonight and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to encourage you to connect with a Bible believing, Bible teaching church so you can grow in your next step. Grow in what you have confessed, grow in what you have believed. And if you need our church, you can call us. That's Innovation Baptist Church, 850-575-0818. Or you can log on to our website, innovationbaptistchurch.org. And someone will help you with the decision that you have made on tonight. Well, my brothers and sisters, thank you so much for sharing your time with us on tonight. We hope that you have been blessed from the word, victorious in the midst of our suffering until the Sunday morning hour 9 30 a.m is our sunday morning worship experience you can visit us at the sanctuary or you can visit us again on facebook live uh, on sunday morning 9 30 a.m if you need a replay of this message you can log on to our website you can get the replay and you can share it with someone else we need sharing of the word in our society today because many people will not they're not showing up at church they're not watching on Facebook Live, but maybe if you send them a message, they may listen because they can listen when they want to. If it's midnight, if it's two o'clock in the morning, if it's midday, they can listen to the message. That's called evangelism. That's what God has called us to do. When he said, go into the, the world, preach and teach my gospel, lo, he will be with us. That is evangelism. So until Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m., stay safe, stay strong, and be blessed. Certainly is my prayer.